And while you're making your way there, I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you again for this day, Lord, just for the time that we've already had in fellowship through worship and prayer and praise. And Lord, indeed, a special day. And I'm almost guilty to say that because with you, Lord, every day is a special day. You're no more resurrected today than any other day. You're no less in or more in love with us today than any other day. And so, Lord, let us praise you as we should every day um, for what you've done for us. But Lord, as we open your word and we look into what that day was and the things that took place that day, Lord, let us remind us, let us refresh our hearts and our minds about your goodness, Lord. And so we thank you in advance. We give you praise and honor, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I've always been fascinated by this week, not just this day, but by this week, because the entire week speaks of a journey. We talked last week, even though we were able to stay in Romans to do so, we talked about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and the fulfillment of prophecy within that. It wasn't just an arbitrary day or in an arbitrary way. And we even raised the question of, was it a triumphal or an untriumphal entry? Because so much of what it seemed that Jesus would do that week seemed to get turned on its head, and yet he came to do exactly what he intended to do, what his whole life was about. And then you go through the week, and as we did on Wednesday night here, we celebrated the Passover Seder, which Jesus celebrated with his disciples during that week. And there's a lot of events of that week that we could have talked about, but we took care of the, the milestones, if you will, and um, Friday would have been that day two days ago, that he, uh, that he was hung on that cross. And sometime that afternoon, he gave up the ghost. And he did so willingly. No one, no one did anything to him that he was not there to allow to happen. You know, and then he was in the grave for three days. And they weren't full days. A lot of people get really weird about the calendar. But it wasn't 72 hours. He said three days. He didn't say three whole days. So he did exactly what he said he would do. And this morning would be the reflection on the fact that he rose again. You know, for a period of time when I was in the military, I was, myself and my family, we were stationed in the southern most parts of Spain. And in Spain, it's a very Catholic nation. And um, we got to witness something we hadn't seen. And this week was known as Holy Week, which a lot of people call it Holy Week. But we watched in amazement the dedication to that week. Um, but the dedication was extreme. And it was very much, in my opinion, in the flesh, and very physical. And, you know, they had many great cathedrals in the area, very, very old. And in those cathedrals were these giant concrete statues of the saints, their saints. And they would literally get those every night. The men would go in and pick those things up. I can't imagine the tonnage. And they would carry him down the cathedral stairs and into the streets. And they would do these processions through the town every night. And as beautiful as their dedication was, the, the costumes that they wore were extremely frightening. <laughs> they were just frightening. It just had nothing to do with God. But they had this dedication that I appreciated. And they carried these giant candles that would burn and drip wax all over the roads and for weeks after Easter you'd drive through the towns and your tires would screech everywhere you went because the roads were literally covered in wax. I'm bringing all that up because I'm thankful that's not what we have to do. I'm thankful that's not what God has asked of us. God did one simple thing when he walked into Jerusalem that week and he just brought himself and his purpose to his people. And all he wanted to do was spend time with them and them with him. He wanted to show that and create love that he had for them by doing exactly what the prophet said he would do and to fulfill that with all the faith that was necessary. Something, quite frankly, none of us would have done or could have done. And so his whole purpose is just about being with those he loves and for those that he loves wanting to be with him. And so that's our privilege. That's our privilege as believers. And you know, so often, and if never any other time, on a, on, a, on a Resurrection Sunday, a pastor will come to the end of their message and give what's typically called an altar call. 
Well, I don't really get into altar calls because I think there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in that and sometimes it's something that's shallow in the end. But I don't want to wait to the end of this message to give you, if you're the one that needs to hear this, the choice. You've come here this morning, you've been in the presence of God's people and God. His Holy Spirit resides here. And if you have been a distant participant in what God wants for you, if you've never actually made your journey to that relationship with him, then what I'm hoping is that the worship that you participated in, the prayers and the praise that you heard, the warmth of the people that you've met this morning, and that presence that you probably can't shake, and the fact that your heart's beating more than anybody else's in this room right now, I hope that as this message goes forth, you can sit there in your chair and tell the Lord, you're done running, and you're coming home. And all you have to do is ask him. He's already done all the work. All you have to do is say, yes, Lord. It's as simple as that. So let's get into this chapter this morning, beginning in verse 1. It says, now on the first day of the week, very clearly, excuse me, clearly, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and they returned from the tomb and told all those, these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. So these women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and other women with them, were outside the tomb where the body of Jesus had been laid. And we read here that they stood there in doubt. And they were totally at a loss. And that's really the literal translation of the words greatly perplexed. They stood there in doubt, and they were completely at a loss. When two angels appeared to them and asked a seriously profound question, why do you seek the living among the dead? That question is both profound And it is also convicting. That question should cause us to look around and see how many things that we encounter, that we interact with on a daily basis that are essentially dead. We should acknowledge that mankind is responsible for filling the world with dead things. We drown in a world of dead things. Now sure, some of the dead things have moving parts. Some of the dead things appear highly intelligent. Some dead things seem to allow us to interact with them. And we've come to believe the dead things serve us and provide us advantages. But what is true is mankind has no ability to create things that are actually alive that actually contain life. Which means that whatever life dead things appear to have is only what we assign to them. And sadly, we've become slaves to dead things. We've become comfortable in the presence of dead things. We've been programmed to interact with dead things and we've become dependent on dead things. In a really sick way, dead things are easier to deal with than things that are alive which is why dead things have replaced the 
replaced and interfered with so many aspects of our lives that were once filled with alive things, that were once filled with life. In a very real sense, we have been led into the worship of dead things. And this is alarming because the worship of dead things requires sacrifice. Things that are actually real and things actually alive are sacrificed when we bow down to dead things. You know, there's an old saying that goes like this, dead men tell no tales. But the truth is, nearly all the tales we believe are the product of dead men. The angels who appeared to the women at the empty tomb asked the women why they would seek the living among the dead. Why would they look in a dead man's tomb for someone who is alive? And why were they so greatly perplexed regarding the empty tomb? The stinging truth is this. The women came to minister to the dead, not to the living. But how did they arrive at their ignorance about the situation? And the answer to that is they did so because they forgot the words that Jesus spoke. The memory had been deadened by his death. The angels had to remind them. The day said to them, he is not here but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in the Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And hearing this, their eyes were reopened and they remembered the words of the Lord. And then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. So the women, forgetting the dead, brought the good news of resurrected life to the disciples. Unfortunately, they found themselves once again struggling with a dead thing. In yet another tomb, the tomb was filled with the remains of the faith of the disciples. Their faith had become a dead thing because they believed the object of their faith was now dead. A dead faith makes the living truth sound like an idle tale and it's hard to believe. Peter, at least Peter, was willing to test his faith and he ran to the tomb to see for himself. It says he rose and ran to the tomb, stooping down. He saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. Peter's faith was made alive again, not because of the presence of a dead thing, but because of a risen Savior. Pick up with me in verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. Two disciples, likely escaping the crime scene in Jerusalem, the death of their Savior. So their hope was dead. And their focus, again, was on dead things. Death was restraining their eyes. They were literally unable to see the life and light in front of them because they observed it through the hazy filter of death. Verse 17. And Jesus said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one whose name was Cleopas answered, And said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And Jesus said to him, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. You know, one has to wonder if 
the disciples might have been more at peace if the body of Jesus was found to be still in the tomb. They would still have been unhappy because Jesus failed to rescue Israel from their oppressors. But if Jesus was still in the tomb, at least what was dead earlier would still be dead. And more importantly, he could still be seen. You see, that's the real difficulty here. They needed to see something to make sense of the situation. That's another problem with all dead things in our world. They're easily seen. They're very visible and they're tangible. Many of us can't unsee them or even leave them alone. And as such, they become the objects of our faith. But then I have to ask, is that actually faith? The writer of Hebrews said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In Romans, Paul said, for we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? And again, Paul in 2 Corinthians, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know, people sometimes say that faith in Jesus is a blind faith. But real blindness comes when our faith is in dead things that we can see and touch but cannot save us. True faith is a faith in the one who was dead, but is now risen and alive, whether he is seen or not. Verse 25, Jesus speaks to them, and he says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. So here Jesus challenges his disciples. In addressing their need to see something, Jesus says, look to the word of God. He bids them to look and to read and to remember what was spoken of by the prophets. There in God's word, they would see that Jesus was indeed the Messiah and that in his sufferings, he fulfilled the prophecies of, to his glory. Look at verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know, we need to remember that in the time that Jesus walked the earth, in the time that the apostles really had their ministries, all they had was what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. And so don't let anybody ever tell you that the gospel is only in the New Testament. I can teach you the gospel from the first five books of the Old Testament, and I can show you proofs of who Jesus was all the way through because it was all written about him. Pick up with verse 28. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them and he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. You know, this simple action by Jesus, as often as it's recorded, seems to draw us into visualizing him. He took the bread, he blessed and he broke it and he gave it to them. We see him this, doing this at the feeding of the multitudes, as well in the midst of the Passover Seder, when he established what we commonly refer to as the com communion service. When Jesus did this, these two disciples finally received what they sought, something to see. But wait, did anything about Jesus change in that moment that made him more visible? No. And yet in their spirits, they became more sensitive and aware as Jesus taught from the scriptures and prayed. In that moment, they experienced the word of God spoken by the word who is God. They were washed in the word and by the word himself. And then metaphorically, scales fell from their eyes. In that moment, Jesus became the substance of the things they hoped for. 
and the evidence of things they had previously not seen. To them, he was once again alive and the object of their faith. And then he vanished. That's an astounding exit, would you not say? But it was so necessary. To me, his vanishing told them and us that the Lord will be seen more at some times in your life than at others. But we must hold on to the vision of him in between those moments because regardless, he remains with you. You know, it's as if the Lord said to them, okay, boys, now you've seen me. I'm risen and alive. Now hold on to it and don't lose the vision. And if you've never had that vision this morning, I hope you capture it. If you haven't thought about it for a while and maybe you've drifted from it, I hope you recapture it. That vision of the risen Lord. Because whether he ever stands before you on earth, you will certainly stand before him someday in heaven, whether you believe or don't. The experience will be much better if you do. Look at verse 32. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? It's almost as if they said, I knew it all along. And while he opened the scriptures to us, so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. How exciting for them and for us to know the Lord is risen and alive. To know we don't have to worship dead things or like in the world's many religions, worship dead ideas and dead idols and dead men. When we take our eyes off dead things of the world and look to the Lord who lives, do not our hearts burn within us? The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to all of us who believe. Now you may argue and say that you've never seen him with your physical eyes. Okay, but you have seen him with spiritual eyes and in your mind's eye and within your heart if you're truly a believer. And you have seen him in the evidences of his goodness in your life and the lives of other believers. Verse 36 Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. Now, I have to be honest. This makes me laugh. And you know, for too many Christians, it's often shocking when they receive exactly what they hoped for and what they prayed for. These disciples needed to see Jesus as proof that he had risen and in order to renew their faith, and now he shows up and they lose their minds. We see here that they actually believed in bodiless entities. This isn't the first time. Like when Jesus approached their boat walking on the sea, they thought that he was a ghost. So it's good Jesus said, peace to you and not boo. But their reaction, once again, proves they were more prepared to believe in something dead than something, or in this case, someone that is alive. You know, we're to fear God, for he is alive and a consuming fire. Not fear dead things that only consume our attention and our time and our peace and our worship. Look at verse 38. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food? I love that. Because what I see is Jesus like laying it all out there 
And he sees that they still don't get it, and he's like, I got to change the subject. You guys got any food? Because maybe if you see me eat, you'll believe that I'm not a spirit. I mean, the scene is worthy of a TV sitcom. Jesus identifies himself, questions their doubts. He offers them the scars of his crucifixion and his physical form as further proofs that he is who he says he is and not a spirit. But somehow in their fearful excitement, they still do not believe. And as I said, I think it's just to snap them out of their foolishness that he asked for food. So fortunately, they were able to respond to that, verse 42. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took and ate in their presence. And then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. He then said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Such grace. Such grace. Jesus didn't scold them for their unbelief. He didn't scold them for their foolishness. Instead, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend. It seems there were still things, even after after listening to Jesus for three years, things that needed clarification and further explanation, and we better not judge them for that. Because you think about how many years you've known the Lord, and you still need clarification, and you still need instruction, and thank God, because that means there's always more. So Jesus restates his purpose and commissioned them, and by extension us, to be his messengers. But their ministry would not begin until they received power from on high, Jesus told them, which came upon them as promised when the Holy Spirit anointed them on the day of Pentecost. Look at verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany, And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. This reflects the transformation of their hearts and their minds. And take note, it was after Jesus departed, after they could no longer see him physically, that they worshiped him. Why? Because they now knew he was risen and alive. Jesus was again the object of their faith, whether seen or unseen. Jesus was again the source of their hope, whether seen or unseen. They would now let the dead attend to dead things. As for them and their households, they would choose to worship the God who is risen and alive because he lives forevermore. I want to read the opening verses of John's gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You know, our world and humanity as a whole is overwhelmed by darkness. Humanity as a whole is a dead man walking unless they decide to walk to the light. That light is Jesus, and he shines in the darkness. But the darkness does not comprehend the light because the darkness represents dead things. Dead things have no ability to comprehend. Dead things are used by the devil to rob humanity, to destroy humanity, and to kill humanity. 
Which is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is in Jesus, so then will be your heart. There in Jesus, dead things are absent. Darkness is absent and life is abundant because Jesus is risen and alive. And in him, by faith, we are risen and alive. Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. Therefore, in him is resurrection life. We abide in him and by so doing, share in the resurrection life. We abide in him and by so doing, we share his light. In John chapter 8, Jesus declared, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. To those that follow Jesus, he is the light of the world that gives the light of life to whosoever believes. In 1 John chapter 1, it says, This is the message which we have heard from Jesus and declare to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, like Jesus, we need to have compassion for this lost, dark world. We need to have compassion for those that are dead in their trespasses as we who believe once were. And like Isaiah, we need to look at the world so that we can proclaim the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You know, I'd encourage you to allow this Resurrection Sunday to be a catalyst for that compassion and a desire to share the gospel and announce every day that Jesus is risen and alive. And let us use Jesus' own words to warn the world of the shortness of the hour and his soon coming again. In chapter 12 of John, Jesus said, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and other, <clears throat> the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified, for he is not here, for he is risen. And that's what we came knowing this morning, most of us. And that's what we should go proclaiming from here today. Not just once a year on Resurrection Sunday, but every day. We need to tell ourselves that in the morning when we rise and before we lay our head on the pillow and be willing to tell everybody we meet that he is alive and he is risen. Amen. You know, I believe our time of communion that we take every Sunday is special every Sunday. Because Jesus said to do that in remembrance of him. And ushers can come forward. But I think particularly on this morning, when we look into the elements of that communion time, it should really strike us in the heart. And just remember that truly was The bread that he took and blessed and broke was a picture of his body that he would give over to be broken but blessed. 
And that third cup of the Passover represented redemption, that when he said this was my blood that would be given willingly for the remission of sins, that he was faithful to do that. And so we need to come with a sense of awe to the communion table. But we also need to come with a sense of overwhelming joy. We're in awe of what he did. We're humbled by the fact that we couldn't have and we didn't deserve it. And yet we're so full of joy for the fact that he did do it. And we put our faith in that. And he grants us by grace salvation. And so make this a special moment. And once again, I'll speak to anybody that might be here or even watching the video later that never has made that decision. You can take the cup and you can take the bread and you can partake of it and it'll simply mean nothing. Or as the cup is passed and the bread is passed, you can make a decision right now and just tell the Lord you're done running and that you indeed want him to come into your life as Lord and Savior. And you'll begin an entirely new life from that point forward. And you can take this cup and this bread this morning and your eyes will be open to what it really means. And if by chance that's you in this room today, please don't go home without talking to one of us. We'd love to pray with you, get you on the right path and then get you dunked in some water to baptize you. So Father, we thank you again for this great day of remembrance. And Lord, let it be just that, a remembrance, but not so special that it wouldn't be special every day of the week. And so Lord, you bless us with your presence, with your word, and with the fellowship of other believers. And so Lord, we just celebrate you now in this time of communion. And we thank you from the deepest parts of our heart that you were faithful You were faithful to do exactly what you said you would do, which gives us all the hope we need for the future and what we wait for. We praise you today, Lord. Give you all honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.